Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. You're listening to The Drag. It's October 3rd, 1885. Six people are dead and more than a dozen attacked after an unknown murderer has terrorized Austin for nine months. The killer has targeted Austin's black community in the dead of night. Multiple black men are in jail, all accused of some kind of connection to the attacks. The two most likely suspects, Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods, are in jail based on eyewitness testimony that's shaky at best. And despite the arrests, Fear still pulses throughout the city. With the police organized night patrol units, the threat of lynching rises, targeting not just those arrested in relation to the crimes, but also black men throughout the city, incarcerated or not. Even though the newspapers claim law enforcement are trying to prevent the lynchings, they might be involved in them too. The night of October 3rd, Austin City Marshal Grooms Lee arrives at the front door of the Black Elephant Saloon one of the only Black-owned businesses in East Austin. The Black Elephant Saloon was a hotspot for police to look for crime. The Daily Statesman says it should, quote, bear watching. The marshal is looking for a man named Alex Mack, sometimes called Alec Mack, in the newspaper reports. The Daily Statesman was kind of obsessed with him and had reported Mack's behavior several times before, detailing his arrests for being drunk and disturbing the peace. According to the story, Mac tells the Austin Daily Statesman, the city marshal finds Mac at the Black Elephant and asks Mac to walk down the street with him. The marshal says that there are two black men he wants Mac to identify, but he doesn't say why. They continue walking the dark streets of Austin. When Mac and the marshal arrive at their destination, there's a police officer and the three noble detectives from Houston waiting for them. One of the men is holding a rope. They tell Mac to walk ahead of them, that they'll show him what they need from him. That's when one of the men puts the rope around Mac's neck, choking him. For some reason, they lead him down the street to the African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's where they grill him about the murders, demanding he tell them what he knows. He says he doesn't know anything, so they knock him to the ground, stomping on him and kicking him. They arrest him, and he's not released for another nine days. He arrives at the Austin Daily Statesman office, ready to tell his story to a reporter, covered in bruises. The story runs in the Statesman on October 16th, nearly two weeks after Mac was accosted by the officers. The Statesman reporter, assigned to the story, rushes to talk to Marshal Grimsley. He needs to know if Alex Max's story is true. Of course, the Marshal says it isn't. I emphatically pronounce the publication of malicious falsehood, concocted in the most damnable spirit. According to Marshall Lee, around 2 a.m., he went to the Black Elephant, along with two Austin police officers and two of the noble detectives. He then called Alex Mack to the door, which that part is true. He said he noticed that Mack was extremely drunk, something he says he's used to with Mack. Then Lee admits that he arrested Mack on a false charge, claiming he had hit someone with the beer glass. Lee says Mack agreed to the arrest, but claimed he was innocent, which, of course he was innocent, made apparent from Lee's confession. The rest of Lee's statement is hard to follow. He says he didn't want to, quote, excite suspicion, so he and his officers led Mac to jail through the city's quietest, darkest streets, where people wouldn't see them. He says, quote, sensible people will understand my purpose. But again, it's hard to follow what his true intentions are. He arrested Mac on a fake charge, then tried to keep it quiet. He says Mac was boisterous due to being drunk and, quote, sometimes violent fighting to get away from the officers. But Lee denies any violence on the officer's part. He was not maltreated in any way, 
and only such force used as was absolutely necessary to conquer him. I never saw such resistance by any prisoner before. Lee says Mac became extremely angry when they got to the jail, so they used a rope hanging on the jailhouse wall to pull him into the cell and lock him inside. The reporter doesn't reveal whose side of the story he believes, but he does write that Mac has threatened to kill police officers before, ending his statesman article with, quote, he would do to watch. You're listening to Devilish Deeds. I'm Megan Parker. This podcast is about America's first serial killer who raped and killed eight people, mostly black domestic servants in Austin in the mid-1880s. This is episode three, Thirst for Blood. Alex Mack is released, but Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods are still in jail, and the case against them hinges upon one man's testimony, Johnson Trigg. He swears he saw Oliver Townsend the night before the murders of Orange Washington and Gracie Vance, the couple who were attacked in their quarters along with two of their friends. And he swears he heard Townsend say he planned to kill Gracie. He also claims he heard Townsend say, quote, I have been killing them and I have not been caught up with yet. Triggs' testimony is compelling and detailed. The timeline he provides matches up with the reports from the victims the night Gracie and Orange died and from the two other women who were injured. Even more damning is Triggs' statement that he heard Townsend at the Black Elephant Saloon a few nights before the 11-year-old girl, Mary Ramey, and her mother, Rebecca, were attacked, saying he was going to kill Rebecca too. Plus, there is a second man who comes forth with a vague statement that appears to back up Triggs' claims. He says he heard Gracie say she was afraid to go home, that there were men in Austin who were angry at her and wanted to hurt her. After the attacks on Gracie and Orange, there's a shooting at the home of two black men. They say another black man came into the yard and started firing a gun at them, grazing one of them. There's no way to know if this shooting is related to the attacks on domestic servants, considering the two victims are men. But since the killer has already proven he's willing to attack men too, the shooting is worth noting. Just over a week after Gracie and Orange died on October 5th, the Austin City Council convenes to discuss the latest developments in the murders. Most of the city council members seem satisfied that they've found the perpetrators of the murders, that Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods are very clearly to blame. The newspapers even started singing the praises of the noble detectives from Houston, even though, according to Skip Hollinsworth's book, The Midnight Assassin, just weeks before, they criticized the detectives and other local law enforcement for being ineffective. Mayor John Robertson addresses the city council, starting by bragging about the efficiency of the noble detectives. He asks for the city council's support in keeping the detectives in town longer, and he speaks to the criticism of his police force. These crimes are abnormal in their character. They occur when and where least expected. They are shadowed in mystery. A motive is wanting. They have baffled the power of the most skillful experts in the detection of crime. But, as we've said before in this podcast, the Austin police force wasn't exactly made up of skillful experts, at least not entirely. Here's Jenna Cooper, the records analyst from the Austin History Center. It mostly comprised uh, men who had a somewhat prominent position in town. Um, Some of these men had been Texas Rangers before, or they had served in the military. Um, It wasn't, it it wasn't a very developed force. It, um, I mean, of course, like I said, investigation tactics were minimal to none. In his speech, the mayor goes on to ask for more funding from the city council to expand the police department's night watch and that the city marshal directly oversees it. He also requests a curfew. Anyone on the streets after midnight should be arrested until they can explain why they're out. Members of the all-white, all-male city council seem split on what to do. Some of them say the police should be supported, that they're doing their best given the circumstances. Others remain openly critical. One councilman says it's embarrassing that Austin has to bring investigators in from another city to handle the cases that the police force should have been able to take care of it. Another councilman suggests a reward for anyone who can come forth with information on the attacks. 
Even though the mayor's speech strongly suggested that Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods were the men responsible for the attacks, the city council doesn't seem so sure. The same councilman who said it was embarrassing to hire external detectives says he's worried a reward will lead to false arrests or convictions, that people would make up stories just to get the money. But despite the councilman's protests, the rest of the city council decides on a $250 reward. That's about $7,000 in today's money. The terms are vague, though the reward is for, quote, the arrest and conviction of any and every person who has heretofore been or who may hereafter be guilty of murder, rape, robbery, burglary, or arson, or of an assault committed in the nighttime with intent to commit murder, rape, or robbery within the limits of the city of Austin. That means the reward isn't just for the attacks on domestic servants. It's for the arrest and conviction of anyone committing any crime in Austin. White supremacy was simply a social given in the American South in the 1880s. The stereotypical image of a criminal is a black man, and this image continues to perpetuate tangible damage to the black community. Obviously, this stereotype is and has always been extremely racist, but with the president of white supremacy, this $250 reward for any person committing any crime is almost asking for an increase of unjust accusations and arrests of black men. Here's Dr. Lauren Henley the professor who has researched these cases extensively. And it's a large quantity of Austin's black male population that is forced into this (laughs) rigmarole. Um, And that's different, though, because we tend to imagine serial killers are white men. Like, that is the trope that exists in (laughs) pop culture. But that's not true. I mean, statistically... I mean, like today, in American society, uh, black serial killers kill disproportionately higher than the percentage of the black population in the country. Um, but we want serial killers to be a particular kind of criminal, and that kind is intelligent and like crafty. Now, that's also not true. That's a myth. But we tend to believe society has constructed the, the values that. Black folks can be criminalized and are a particular kind of criminal, but that kind of criminal is simply a murderer, right? a one type, one victim murderer. It's not this habitual thing about serial murder that requires intellect and cunning skill and foresight and things like that. That is all related to the history of Black criminalization. The city council also allocates $1,000, about $28,000 in today's money, for keeping the noble detectives in town longer. Even though Townsend and Woods are still behind bars, many in Austin still don't feel safe. And it turns out they had good reason to worry. Just days after Triggs' confession that he'd seen Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods the night that Gracie Vance in Orange, Washington died, the case falls apart. Trick admits he made it all up. He's arrested for perjury and eventually is sentenced to five years in jail. And the public's faith in the noble detectives also falls apart. According to Skip Hollingsworth's book about the murders, Trick works at the hotel where the detectives are staying. There's some speculation that the detectives are involved in Trick's false statement. The nobles are gone a few weeks later. During the last year, a number of the most dastardly crimes known to the law have been committed in this city. In some instances, murder, and in others, murder and rape, and in others, murderous assaults with knife hatchet, or pistol. These crimes have been of the most revolting character, attended with evidences of the grossest brutality and perpetrated at the dead hours of night in nearly every instance upon colored females. They have occurred in the most unexpected quarters and have always been involved in mystery. The community has been outraged and shocked by these crimes, and the blood of the victims has appealed for vengeance. Throughout November 1885, the month after Johnson Trigg recants his accusations, the newspaper reports arrest after arrest of black men in Austin. Then, on November 22nd, a familiar name appears in the newspaper reports, Walter Spencer. You might remember that name. He was Molly Smith's boyfriend. Molly was the first victim of this unknown serial killer, and Walter was attacked with an axe that same night. Investigators determined that there was no way his wounds could have been self-inflicted, 
they were too serious. But as quickly as Walter's name appears in the newspaper reports, it disappears. On December 11th, the charges are dropped. It's quiet in Austin throughout the fall of 1885. There aren't any more attacks, no murders, no midnight rock throwings or door knockings. Not since September. The city council finally appoints those new police officers they approved the funding for. There's now a city marshal, a sergeant, and 20 policemen. Previously, there had only been 12. Many Austinites look forward to Christmas in 1885. School children sing in choirs, there is an abundance of parties and celebrations to attend across Austin, and even the insane asylum inmates get an annual visit from St. Nick. The last attack by the Midnight Assassin was almost three months ago to the date. People are desperate to shed the fear they've been carrying for nearly a year. It's Christmas Eve in Austin. Tonight, all is calm. It's late, sometime just before midnight. A reporter from the Austin Daily Statesman is chatting with the new city marshal on a street corner. A private watchman runs up to them, distressed. He says, quote, A woman has been chopped all to pieces. Blood, blood, blood. Last night's horrible butchery. The demons have transferred their thirst for blood to white people. The city marshal, the watchman, and the reporter rush to the home owned by Moses Hancock, an elderly white man. His wife had been attacked. 43-year-old Susan Hancock was a white woman. It's the first time the unknown serial killer has targeted white women. When the Statesman reporters arrive, two doctors are already there, dressing Susan's wounds. She has two giant gashes in her skull, and blood pours from both her ears and her mouth. The doctors try to save Susan's life with much more effort than any of the black victims received. Despite their efforts, she screams as she takes her last breath while blood pours from her mouth. Her husband, Moses, is distraught. When the statesman reporter interviews him, he seems distracted and, quote, disconnected. Moses says his daughters went to a Christmas party earlier that evening, and they left the doors unlocked so they could get back inside safely after their parents had gone to sleep. But somebody else got in. Moses gives the statesman his account of the evening. He wakes up, and his pants are missing. He thinks he's been robbed, so he goes to his wife's room to check on her. In those days, it wasn't uncommon for spouses to sleep in separate rooms. He sees his wife's bed covered in blood, a glow in the moonlight. But Susan's nowhere to be found. He leaves through a back door of the house and sees Susan laying in a pool of her own blood in the backyard. He picks her up, rushing her into the house and calls for his neighbor to help. Moses is elderly, so he struggles with his wife's body. His neighbor helps him carry Susan into the parlor where they anxiously await the two doctors. They arrive moments later. Moses also says he saw a man running away and jumping the fence, most likely running alongside the Colorado River behind his house. The bloodhounds return, hot on the murderer's trail. Well, sort of. They lead the officers up the river, and then the trail goes cold. The station reporter also notes the scene looked like a robbery. Dr. Lauren Henley thinks this is indicative that the serial killer terrorizing Austin in the 1880s wasn't just one man, but several. Most serial killers kill intraracially. So the fact that we have a bunch of black women and a black man who's the victim victims, and then two white women, I'm not sure it's the same person. Like, statistically, serial killers kill within their own race. We know that. To suddenly switch modus operandi at the last moment, or what we now know to be the last moment, it could be that the killer's fantasy was not being fulfilled, so they escalated it. It could be that these are copycat murders, and it could be that the killer just kind of stopped. Right, that the two victims at the last point, Gracie and Orange, that killing two people at once, and in particular killing a man, somehow disrupted the fantasy and forced this person to stop doing these things. I don't know. But whoever the murderer or murderers are, they're not done for the night. The statesman reporter kneels by Susan Hancock's side as she dies, when he hears a shrill voice pierce through the cold night. There's been another attack just an hour after this one. 
Just after midnight, James Phillips Sr. awakes to his son, also named James, who goes by Jimmy, calling for help. Jimmy's an adult, but at this time, it's not uncommon for adults to live with their parents. So Jimmy lives in his father's house with his wife, Eula, and their 18-month-old son. Philip Sr. walks into Jimmy's room, someone had left the door open, and sees Jimmy covered in blood. In fact, all he can see is blood. The bed is drenched in it. Jimmy lays on his right side. There's a deep gash above his ear. It's clear how he got the injury. There's a bloody axe laying next to the bed. Jimmy's young son is nearby, covered in blood, but thankfully unharmed. Jimmy's wife, Eula, is nowhere to be found, but there's a trail of blood leading out the door, onto the veranda, and into the yard. Her skin is covered in abrasions. There's dirt and sticks in her hair. A pool of blood spreads beneath her body. A piece of wood lays across her chest and arms. She's clearly dead. The statesman later suggests that Eula was sexually assaulted with a piece of wood. But the wording is vague enough that it's hard to say. It's not clear how Eula got outside, if she was dragged by her attacker or if she tried to run when she was still alive. But either way, it seems clear that there were two people involved in this attack, according to the statesman reporter on the scene. Both of Eula's hands were held down by pieces of wood, which means her killer might have had help. It takes only 24 hours for the crimes to hit national newspapers. Six black people have been brutally murdered and dozens of others attacked over the course of a year in Austin. And it takes only a day after the murders of two white women for the broader public to care. The New York Times publishes a story about the murders on December 26th. The facts in the story are a little shaky. They claim that 13 black women had been raped and seven had been murdered in the year prior. And they say eight white women had been attacked, four raped, and three murdered. They write that over 400 arrests have been made. And at least that part seems likely, since Austin's police department had no trouble arresting black men left and right throughout the year the murderer terrorized Austin. Regardless of the facts, it takes the death of the white women for the national media to care. The New York Times briefly mentions the black domestic servants who'd been attacked and killed. But the article is mostly dedicated to the white victims, Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips. The newspaper even writes that Susan was beautiful and educated. Back in Austin, if the city's residents had been scared and angry before, they were terrified and furious now. Christmas was hardly Christmas yesterday. Early in the morning, groups of men could be seen along and at the street corners discussing not the social topics of a Christmas day, but the damnable crimes that had been committed the night previous in the city of Austin. The murders of the black domestic servants in the city had been scary to the white residents, of course, but not because they cared deeply about the city's black community. They feared that the deaths of the black servants would lead to loss of the way of life as they knew it. So ingrained were these black women in the day-to-day -day workings of Austin society. But even more than that, they feared the killers would escalate to killing white women, too. And those worst fears had finally been realized. Here's Dr. Lauren Henley again. Black society in Austin cared. These were not nobodies who were just murdered and then had no family members and no community to care about what happened. These were individuals who were part of a robust and really diverse African-American community located in Austin, predominantly along the east side because of segregation. And when members of their own community were murdered, if they were upset, they genuinely cared. So even though white society had created domestic servitude as a way to sort of erase right, black members, right, they literally put them in outhouses behind their main houses to obscure the fact that they're doing all kinds of things to support white supremacy. These are still black folks who are part of robust communities. They have family members, they go to church, they attend dances and parties and festivals. They have loved ones and playmates, they're in school. If they do all kinds of things, all of these women had people who cared about them. And when they were murdered, Austin's black community was rightfully upset. So yes, white supremacy erased this 
from the mainstream narrative until they couldn't ignore it anymore. And whether they couldn't ignore it anymore because their domestic servants were being murdered and now they didn't have someone to cook and clean and look after their children or because two of their own were murdered and now they're worried that the killer has gotten a penchant for killing white folks, it's hard to say. But I don't want to diminish the fact that like these are actual people whose lives were lost and entire communities had to cope with that. Jenna Cooper with the Austin History Center said this was a major turning point. There's this, you know, continuously simmering fear that really boils over in December of 1885. City leaders hold a public meeting at the Capitol in response to the city's fear and outrage. Mayor John Robertson calls for the city's black and white communities to come together to find the killer or killers, and several other powerful members of Austin society speak out to agree with him. One of the men, a lawyer, reminds the public that lynching isn't the answer, and another cautions against criticizing the police. Others pledge money or resources to help find the killer. The statesman calls for the community to take matters into its own hands, telling the citizens they need to protect themselves since the government can't do it. Though the reporter makes sure to say the authorities aren't to blame here, that the murders are, quote, a mystery of mysteries. The statesman calls once again for what it sees as the only answer, turning citizens into night watchmen for their neighborhoods, five to ten people in each ward. Everyone in town seems to agree with them, So the city raises money to pay these men to do their duty and protect their city, saying that these men should be, quote, trusted implicitly and no questions be asked of them as secrecy is essential to success. The most recent attacks led to paranoia across Austin. The statesman publishes reports of a few seemingly harmless incidents. One man reports a group of men acting suspiciously, quote, as if they were afraid to be seen. A few reports surface of people seeing men in their yards, then running off. There's an attempted mugging outside of a brothel in the city's red light district called Guy Town. One woman reports that someone was trying to get into her door. There are seemingly run-of-the-mill crimes for a growing city in the 1880s, but for a city on edge, anything seems suspicious or terrifying. It's not unreasonable to wonder if there's a killer lurking around any dark corner or in any alleyway. So the city council sets a curfew. All saloons and liquor stores will close at midnight. Another 30 police officers will be added to the force. The city marshal tells the police force and the citizen watchmen that any man out past curfew should be questioned. And if the man doesn't have a good story, to give him 24 hours to leave the city entirely. Here's the Austin History Center's Jenna Cooper again. It caused people to be very, very wary Um, There were curfews enacted, um, businesses would close early, um, you know, people felt very afraid to walk about unescorted. In a letter published in the Statesman entitled, A Woman's Advice to Women, a woman identified only as Mrs. F. writes, The assassins are around again, and the men, no doubt, are doing all they can for our protection. But let me tell you how, in a measure, we can protect ourselves. One good dog and a revolver will do it. The dog in your house and the revolver under your pillow. Miss F goes on to write that the murders likely wouldn't have happened if the victims simply had a dog. The paranoia also, of course, extends to the police department. Dozens of arrests happen in the weeks that follow the Christmas Eve murders. Oliver Townsend and Doc Woods, the two men arrested for the murders of Orange Washington and Gracie Vance, based on fake eyewitness testimony, are arrested again, then released again. There's a pair of white men wearing bloody clothes apprehended in the town of Temple, about 75 miles north of Austin. A black man in San Antonio claims to have committed the murders with Doc Woods. Police also arrest a Mexican man who had bloody clothes and knives on him. The Texas governor even announces a reward. $300 for an arrest that leads to a conviction in the deaths of Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips. About $8,500 in today's money, which the statesman deems too low to motivate anyone to come forward, despite being more than what was offered before white women became victims. And as Austin descends into panic, Jimmy Phillips, whose wife Eula was murdered on Christmas Eve and who himself was injured in the attack, sits in jail 
still recovering from his wounds. Despite the fact that his father found him that night bleeding badly, he's been arrested for his wife's murder. Next on Devilish Deeds. Murder will out. Run down the midnight assassins. Keep your doors bolted and windows securely fastened. There's this theory in the newspapers that it's a gang of men, of black men, being driven mad by a full moon. This podcast is hosted, reported, and produced by me, Megan Parker. It's also reported, written, and produced by Mina Anderson and edited by Katie Pinchik Outka. Sound design by Matt Bolin. Robert Quigley and Katie Pinchik Outka are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Mooney College of Communication. The associate producers are Cameron Greiser, Sewa Oliveras, Bethany Stork, Miranda Vilches, Kadeja Balde, Ashley Misnazi, Lori Groby, Lakin Nauman, and Sumaya Malik. Thank you to our voice actors, John Bridges, Christian McDonald, Emmanuel Ogu, Kosi Maloku, Gerald Johnson, Kevin Robbins, Raul Hernandez, Emily Quigley, and Robert Quigley. A huge thank you to Leslie Schwach for all of her support and guidance. We also want to thank Dean J. Bernhardt, Kathleen McElroy, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, Kathleen Mabley, Anne Jorgensen, Emily Quigley, and Jay Whitman of the Moody College of Communication. And special thanks to Robert Philwalk and Ann Sellers. Additional sound effects are from zapsplat.com. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students an amazing educational experience. Thank you. 